back. He was a three-time Pro Bowler. Uh, there was a time running downhill with that Cowboy offensive line. He was at the top of the heap among NFL running backs, went to Philly, then Tennessee, and just announced his retirement. So jacked up to see DeMarco Murray, former NFL top running back, joining us in the herd today. Went to Bishop Gorman High School where my daughter just graduated. That is a football power. Holy mackerel, that's a football power. So you had offers to come back. Okay, you had people that said, you want to come try out? And you're like, nah, how come? I was ready. I was ready. It was a long career for me. It was something that, for me, eight years was my goal. Eight years was my identity to finish my career. And mentally, physically, I was ready for another chapter in my life. And it was fun. I had an unbelievable career. I was very privileged and honored to play in the NFL. And um, talking with my family, talking over with my agent, people that were close to me, I made the best decision to move on and walk away from the game. It was hard. It was very hard, but I was excited about it. You know, it is interesting, and I've always supported players on this. If a company came to me and say, we just traded you to your rival, you got traded as a cowboy to an eagle, and it was a a, a weird spot because Chip Kelly was the coach. And I always uh, – you signed there, excuse me. But athletes, you get – you have very short careers, and there's limited places you can go to, and sometimes you get traded. And fans, you know, most people in America – they grow up in a town, and they stay in the town. They don't get traded to other companies. They don't leave for other companies. The transition was interesting. You were a cowboy, and then you moved to Philadelphia, and it's the Chip Kelly thing, and the Chip Kelly thing didn't work. When you were there, did you sense the unraveling before it happened? I did. I did. It was a great offense, great offense a system that has, has worked well for him in the past at the collegiate level in his first and second year in the National Football League. So for me, looking at that, Knowing Dallas Cowboys rival, they're not giving me the contract that I want. Right. We can't come to an agreement. Right. So for me, I go, I'm going to go up, up north. I'm going to go, you know, play for the Eagles, try to play the Cowboys twice a year and see what I can make happen. But the offensive system was different. We didn't have the personnel. We had, I love him to death. <laughs> My guy, Sam Bradford, running the read option. You know, he's, he's a great, <laughs> great guy, you know, but... If he pulls the ball, they're not respect that defensive end is not going to respect him once he if he's running the read option. Right. They're going to close on the running back, and we just didn't have the personnel. And Chip is a great guy, great great coach. Um, did a lot for the National Football League in his first couple of years there, but I think the personnel wise in my years of, in Philadelphia was not the best. You know, for that offense is playing for the Cowboys different. It is. It is. Um, you got, you got a lot of eyes on you. And and having played there for four years at a high level, playing with Jason Witten, Tony Romo, those type of guys, um, it's, a, it's a great organization to be a part of. You got Jerry, you got Coach Gary, you got a lot of eyes on you. You got a lot of fans no matter where you go, different arenas. You have a lot of fans. And it's a privilege to play there, but you have to be careful. You can't get trapped into off-the-field issues. Once you have one issue, it's going to escalate. Now they're talking to your teammates. Why did this guy do You're taking away from – the credibility of the team if you get into any type of trouble. So you were a superstar at Oklahoma. You go to the Dallas Cowboys, and you were, I mean, and I'm not exaggerating, you were one of the talk talking points of the league for about three years. And then Dallas doesn't give you a contract. Now, Jerry generally has very good relationships with players. You'd put up huge numbers. How are you not bitter? I'm not, only because the organization – did so much for me. To play on that stage, to play in the National Football League, it's a privilege. And I played with unbelievable guys, Jason Witten, Tony Romo, guys are still my friends to this day. And it's a business. You know, looking at the Le'Veon Bell situation, I understand on both sides. Now there's a huge trust factor because he's done it two years in a row. So I can say this is probably his last year with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right. And, and it's just a business. You know, uh, for me, I, I didn't have any off-the-field issues. I didn't have any None. stipulations. You know, I had some injuries early on in my career, which – That was their biggest thing for me. And I understood that. So we had myself, Des Bryant, coming up for these contract extensions, and they had to make the best decision for the Dallas Cowboys. And, you know, it so happened that it didn't work out for either one of us. (laughs) You know, DeMarco Murray joining us. Here's what's interesting. And this has happened in the NFL. We used to have huddles. There's no huddles. Right. We used to have fullbacks. There's no fullbacks. Safeties used to be huge, crucial. Increasingly, with all the receivers, safeties are being marginalized. So... We're, we're, so I see football changes a lot. Baseball looks a lot like it used to. Now we're seeing defensive shifts. It's starting to look different. But the analytics, if I was a running back like Le'Veon Bell, running backs, Todd Gurley, are becoming valuable receiving weapons. And Le'Veon's like, hey, time out. 
I'm a running back, but my offensive production's also through the air. Do you sense in the National Football League running backs feel like now they're, 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 there's a stigma? You're a running back. But it's becoming a passing league. What do you make of these? Like, Lavian's one of those guys that wants to change the paradigm. I want receiving money, too. Is, is it a viable argument? It, it could be fair on certain situations. When you look at it, it is, it's been a passing league for a long time. But obviously, you three years ago, I averaged four years ago, I averaged 25 carries a game. That downhill cowbell type of back has only been three since 2007. Myself, Le'Veon Bell last year, and, and Chris Johnson. So I think you have to have, have a different dimension in your game. Being a receiver, a valuable receiver in that offense, it, you know, it, it's great because you can take a two yard pass and you can turn it into a six yard because everyone's dropping out. So if you look at a Le'Veon, Le'Veon Bell situation, talk, those are two great versatile, versatile backs that can run, block, and catch. So they're not going to get paid the top dollar that you expect, but you look, look at Todd Gurley, he just got big, big money. He just reset the running back market, which is great, but you have to be able to receive the ball when you play running back. You, can't, you, you have to be two-dimensional. You're obviously a smart guy. You've taken great care of yourself, family guy. You're in Nashville now. You stayed there. You love the city, great city. And I, I, running back is a position where you get beat up. I mean, yes. it's, the, it's really the only position in football where you run and the people who tackle you, you can't see. It's the only position. The receiver can catch it and know there's a safety over the top. Right. When you run through that line, DeMarco, you have no idea where it's coming from. So running backs' careers are short. Selfishly, if I was a running back, I would want to be heavy on the receptions because if you throw the ball out of the backfield i can see who i'm not going to get my legs cut out you have more space when you catch the ball in a flat swing route. you have more space you can see everyone on the field as opposed to being a running back you're running through the line line of scrimmage like you mentioned it's a lot harder you have 11 guys you have 300 pound plus guys trying to tackle you fall on you plus your offensive guards plus the entire offensive and defensive line those are big guys you know these guys are all falling on you so when you have an opportunity to Catch the ball out in the flat, on the flat line up and slot. Small corner like David on Johnson you. does a lot. Yeah, and you can you can accelerate different matchups, and it's going to be harder for them to take you off the field in certain situations. So, what do you make of you know? We've been talking about this today. I'm, I'm trying to get Joy to come over to my side on this. <laughs> um, I don't really care who guys date, but I do think when you're the franchise quarterback, I'd stay out of the adult film star business. <laughs> but. Sean Merriman came on earlier and said, dude, it's not the first time. He just went to a restaurant where there's TMZ. (laughs) What do you make? If you're the coach, you know how locker rooms are. Good God, you were in Dallas where Tony Romo on a bye week went to Mexico and people ate him alive. (laughs) Are the media, are we being ridiculous saying, Jimmy, and not a great look? I think it's a great conversation amongst the locker room. Training camp is is here. Guys are tired. Guys are banging into each other. So around the locker room, it's going to be great to have a chuckle or two here at Jimmy G. If he's playing well, this is this is a guy that played well last year. He right. just got traded. But you can look at it from a coaching standpoint in a organizational. You don't want your starting quarterback dating this guy. But us as players, we don't care. We, as long as he's winning, as long as he's playing dominantly like he has been, we don't care who he dates, but it's also a camaraderie builder because you can have guys in the locker room talk amongst each other, talk to Jimmy. Guys that may not really talk to him, they can come in and maybe crack a joke here or two. You know, it, it, it lets guys relax a little bit. Now, if he struggles, I doubt he will, but if he struggled, would there be any players that said, well, yeah, you're out at night with that? I, I doubt it because I'm sure this will probably be the last video that he <laughs> he's going to be seeing. It. He, he's going to make sure that he goes somewhere else that TMZ will not follow him with a camera phone. By the way, when you lived in Dallas, and again, in your peak years, you were the offensive player of the year, you led the NFL in rushing, you led it in total yards, you were a pro bowler. You were a star for the biggest brand in football. Could you have a private life? What was it like to leave practice for DeMarco Murray? For me, I maintained privacy. That was my biggest thing. I wasn't a big social media guy. I always tried to make sure that if I did go to dinner, did go on a family vacation, I wasn't putting it out there for the world to see or for cameras to attract me. And it's hard. It's hard to live a private life. But us as players, as as athletes, you know, we kind of signed away the privacy because, you know, we play the game that we play. And it's a great game. And 
we do it for the fans, we do it for the championships, we do it for each other. But at the end of the day, you have to keep your privacy. You got to stay sane to some point, and that's how you can do it by trusting different people. You can't you can't trust everyone. There's always someone out to hey, he's here, he's there. So you have to be careful who you're telling where you're going. You know. I've defended Jason Garrett. I don't think he's Belichick or Sean Payton, but I think he's good. And I think Jerry can be, and I like Jerry, but Jerry's not the easiest owner to play with. He, he's the only owner that has press conferences after games. Give me Jason Garrett's strength as a coach and perhaps a weakness. I think Jason Garrett's strength as a coach, he's a great motivator. He gets guys to play at a high level for him because he doesn't have any kids. The team, I played there. When, when he speaks in front of the team, when he's around, he's a guy's guys. He, ha- he hangs out with the guys. He makes us feel like we're important, like we're family. We are family. And I think, I think his weakness, I would have to say, just managing the game. I think he can do a little bit better at managing the game in certain situations, critical moments, you know, two-minute situations, two-minute drill, running the ball at the end of, in the game. So I think when I was there, we didn't play so well in the fourth quarter. Our last drives weren't as good. They didn't, we didn't give ourselves a chance because timeouts were being t- called. Challenges weren't made. These so are I the th- knocks. The, the, by the way, this is what the fans in Dallas say. Yeah. What, what, you're, what the fans are seeing, you were dealing part with. Of, yes, and, and you go through meetings and you have a quarterback like Tony Romo's great guy. He's another coach on the field. Jason Witten is another great guy on the field, but... Jason Garrett was able to lean on these guys because they were coaches on the field. So in certain situations, two-minute situations, Romo's got it. We work on these situations every day. We started to work on them after my first and second year, and we became great at them. And we became great at fourth fourth quarter situations, two-minute situations where we're trying to score and get the ball back for our defense. Yeah, so he had a flaw and he worked on it. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw the – there was an Amazon Prime series – you know, these hard knock things on HBO and Amazon Prime had something on the Cowboys. And I mean, Dez obviously is still an NFL player. How great he is, is debatable. But in the Amazon Prime series, there's a moment where Dez Bryant is just imploding on a simple meeting because his receiver coach is saying, you know, this this Denver secondary is about as good as we'll face. And Dez just kind of implodes. And I've theorized to Marco that NFL people see that and think, hell, that's not even a that's that meeting imploded. You can say it now. I love his passion, but it, Dak Prescott's numbers were better. He's 14 and 2 when he's targeted eight or more receivers. I think Dez can be hard on a young quarterback because he is you feel like you almost like I've got to go. <laughs> Do you, did you sense with Dez, there are times that it, he can be a burden, overbearing in the game. Dez is a, is a great player. He still can play the game. You hear passion a lot. That's what, you know, that's the word around Dez Bryant. He has, he's very passionate. And he is. He, I've been around him for four years of my career. The hardest working player I've ever seen besides Witten. And he has some maturity issues that we know. He has a checker pass that we know of. And seeing that, seeing the antics on the sideline, living it firsthand, I, I know how hard it can be on the team. Not just a coach, not just a quarterback. So seeing it on Amazon Prime, the last years when I weren't there, I know Dak is a young guy. He's not Tony Romo. He doesn't have thick skin like Romo. Romo can't, Romo could, call, Des, calm down. Hey, I'll throw you a slant here just to calm you down. Well, Dak can't do that. Dak isn't at that level yet. He doesn't have that maturity level to say, hey, Des, calm down. I'm coming to you in different situations. So I think it, it, it does hurt Des. That's why he is a free agent, because coaches, GMs, they see these things, and we don't want this guy around our team. So you saw the series, too. I saw the series. I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm watching. I'm like, good God, if I'm a coach, I'm like, it was just, it'd be one thing if it was one of those really intense meetings. Right. It was just eight guys in a room, and the coach is talking, and the coach is now cornered, and Dez is going after him. And, you know, sometimes these reality shows, they're not good for marriages. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> and they're not, they're not good for all players. Um by the way, you're a former Oklahoma star. I've been tough on Baker Mayfield. Brought him you here. You have. You've been very tough. I saw the segment. I saw it. I was a little surprised. I was shocked, Colin. Why? One, he's an Oklahoma guy. Heisman Trophy winner. I love. He's great. He's, I love he, Bob he's a, yeah, I, I spent time with him. We were together in game four. Cleveland and Warriors. It was a horrible game. <laughs> it was a horrible game, but it was a great chance for Baker and I to spend time together. Got to meet his fiance now. He's a, he's a terrific guy. I would go back. I remember going back to Oklahoma two years ago when he was a junior. And listening to the trainers, listening to the coaches. And I played with Sam Bradford, Heisman Trophy winner. Great guy, Oklahoma City guy who, who's loved. 
they go, this is the guy. Baker's the guy. Mentally, physically, emotionally, he gets it. The camaraderie within, within the locker room, the organization, the, the community, they love him. He's the right kind of guy. And I'm excited to see what he's going to do in Browns. Hopefully, hopefully he starts day one. People we'll in see. Oklahoma <laughs> don't like me. Hopefully he starts day one. Did you hear that? Yeah. What? Hopefully he starts day now one. Now let's slow down. <laughs> Give him time to grow. You, you and Joy just want to rush him out to the field. It's the number one overall pick in the draft. Well, he was a little overdrafted. Listen, I, I will say this. I know oh, people in Oklahoma just hate me. But if by me pressing him and his great answers, I thought it helped him. I had two NFL guys that texted me that day, and they were like, that was good. He's very mature. He's very mature. You see the antics on the sideline, things of like that. But, you know, he's, he's being competitive. You don't see that from a quarterback. But I think he may tone it down. And NFL is a little different. So I told him there will be guys that try to pressure buttons because of your history. But just stay the course, learn from Tyrod, learn from the, the Browns organization, and just play the game, have fun. That's it. But he'll be fine. He'll be fine. <laughs> By the way, this was... Um... Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.